Hi everybody, I'd like to have a talk about some mechanics today and specifically to try to derive this formula for the stretching frequency of a diatomic molecule. I'm going to be using some ideas from Newtonian mechanics that you might have come across in the later stages of a high school education in physics or maths, um, but I thought it'd be interesting to see them being used in explicitly a chemical type context. I'm aiming to present the physics and equations here in a slightly casual way, so if you like the style of this presentation, do consider giving this video a like and consider subscribing to my channel, that would be awesome. Okay, so to start, I'm going to represent my molecule as um, two masses, M1 and M2, could be the same, could be different, um, separated by a spring of spring constant K. So going for a mechanics type approach to this, each one of the two masses could move in uh, three dimensions, so each one could vibrate, say, this way, or in and out of the plane, or backwards and forwards. So we need to think about which of those movements correspond to a stretch on its own and not some other type of movement for this system. So for example, if both of these masses were to move down, that would correspond to the molecule moving and not stretching. Um, we can also have a situation where if if one was going down and one was going up, that would correspond to a rotational movement. So there is in fact only one scenario where we can get a pure stretch of this spring, which is when M1 and M2 are moving in different directions. Now it's possible in that situation that uh, one of those movements is bigger than the other one, so there might be a translation to the side along with a stretch. So we need to specifically think about the frame of reference where the center of mass of this doesn't move. That will correspond to some sort of zero momentum frame in all circumstances, be it linear or angular momentum. I'm going to define the bond length as L, and I'm going to define the center of mass as a position somewhere around here, which is a distance D away on the, on the left. So taking moments about M1, we'd expect the moment to be the same just considering the effect of M2 to being the same as if it, all the mass of the system was moving through the center of, center of mass point in the middle. So for example, we can say that the total mass, which is M1 plus M2 times by D is gonna be equal to, well, M2 times by L. This tells us what D is um, in terms of L. As we would expect, in my diagram, say if M2 is smaller, we expect the center of mass to be closer to M1. So going forward, just thinking about the motion that is a pure stretch around the center of mass point at equilibrium, we'd expect there to be a point where there's no tension um, in the spring in the middle. So um, this is my center of mass, C of M in the middle. And we'd expect this distance here to be a fraction M2 over M1 plus M2 times by L. And we'd expect this to be, well, the remainder of L. So that has to be M1 plus M2. And L is our equilibrium bond length in a chemical sense. So this is useful that we now know that if we are purely stretching about the center of mass, any distance that's on this side is this fraction of the total distance between the two masses. And it's this fraction on the right-hand side. So I'm now going to stretch my spring and extend it to a distance L plus X, where X is the extension of the spring. But in the case where the center of mass is staying where it is, the ratios should be the same for the distances on either side. So this distance will still be the ratio M1 over M1 plus M2 times by L plus X. And the one on the left, again, will be the smaller one, M2 over M1 plus M2 L plus X. So now we need to consider the motion of these masses away from their equilibrium position. So we define their equilibrium position above. So for example, that's here, and I'm just gonna consider M2. The mass will work the same if I consider M1. So for mass M2, I'm going to define its position away from equilibrium here as a distance or a displacement X2, and displacement of mass one is going to be X1. Apologies. in. Uh, editing, I've noticed that I've labelled X1 incorrectly here. X1 should be from that position of equilibrium to M1, not from the centre of mass to the equilibrium position. 
Now this looks like we've got too many variables kicking around, but actually because we know the distances and we're keeping the center of mass the same, we can say something about X1's relationship to X2. So we're going to do a similar deal as before we're taking moments either side. We know in fact that M1 times by X1 must equal M2 times X2. So that allows me to write X1 in terms of X2, M2 over M1 times by X2. Now I should note that there is a strong link to um, the system described above here with just one mass attached to a spring that might be more familiar to you from the world of physics. And we'll try and make that link now. We can consider just the mass M2 and think about a three body diagram on here and apply uh, Newton's second law which tells us that the resultant force on a body will cause an acceleration in a, with proportion to its mass. So what we have is an equilibrium position. We have the spring extended, this is M2. We defined the direction as positive this way. There's a force pulling backwards on that mass. Um, and we know what this force is just purely from Hooke's law. So this force will just be the spring constant times by the total extension of the, the, the bond or the spring. So that's just equal to K times X1 plus X2. Okay, the mass will be accelerating in this direction. That's the acceleration. This is equal to the second derivative of the displacement X2 with respect to time. So now using Newton's second law, well, the acceleration and the force are in opposite directions. So I'm going to say minus K of X1 plus X2 is equal to the mass M2 times by the acceleration of M2. At this point, it's lucky that we have a relationship that tells us what X1 is in relation to X2. This will allow us to get the differential equation just in terms of one variable. So I can substitute in for x1 minus k, so x1 is um, m2 over m1 times by x2 plus x2 is equal to m2 times by the second derivative with respect to time of x2. So doing a bit of tidying up I can pull the x2 out of the brackets and then I can divide through by m2. At this point, I noticed that this bit here is a bit clunky. Um, we can rearrange it uh, in a different form that will help us manipulate it algebraically. So I'm just going to cross multiply and put it over the same uh, denominator. So now in this equation, we can see that, well, clearly this is just a constant, just depends on the masses. K is a constant that depends on the spring constant or it is the spring constant. So that's going to be dependent on the electronic structure of our molecule if we've got a vibrating diatomic. Um, and all we have is on the um, right hand side, a second derivative with respect to x2. And on the left hand side, we've got x2 on its own. So to solve this equation, we're going to need to think of perhaps a trial function and see how it works. I need something that when I differentiate it twice, I get a negative sign and I pull out a constant. And that, that there's a well known trial function that will work very well in this situation. Um, I'm going to say that x2 is of the form a constant a times by sine of omega t plus a phase angle. So this is where the omega is the angular frequency. So this is related to the period of the oscillation. The phi just tells me um, when I started my oscillation with respect to time. So if I was considering the equilibrium position at t equals zero, I would set my phase angle to zero. So this is the general solution to that differential equation. We can do a quick check. If I differentiated that once, so that's dx2 by dt, all I would do is pull out an omega out the front. So that would give me omega a. I'd switch the sign to a cos and the stuff inside the brackets would stay the same. Second derivative, d2 by dx squared by dt squared. Well, I'm gonna pull out another omega, so that's omega squared times by a, when we differentiate cos, we get minus sine plus the stuff in the brackets. And now we can see by inspection that this whole bit here is nothing but x2. So I can rewrite the second one as minus omega squared times by x2.
And this is the usual form of an equation for simple harmonic motion. Now, by looking at our two expressions, we can work out what the angular frequency of the oscillation is. So specifically, I need the one that's derived for our uh, two mass diatomic system and the general solution down here. So we can see that we know what omega squared is, which is the square of the angular frequency. That's just going to be equal to k times by m1 plus m2 over m1 m2. Now, this is often formulated in a slightly different way where we define the reduced mass, where, um, where we have k over mu. And here, we're just going to define a thing called the reduced mass is equal to m1 m2 over m1 plus m2. So this is the reduced mass mu. So now we know the angular frequency omega is the square root of k over mu. But what is the angular frequency? Well, it's not very helpful for us if we're, unless we're trying to think about the actual motion, which in chemistry, we just need to know, know more about the, the frequency. So different people use different terms for this. This would be equal to two pi times by the frequency. This new symbol is the same as F in other circumstances. So that's the sort of linear frequency. So I know my linear frequency is equal to one over two pi times by k over mu. Now two pi's come in from the properties of a sine wave. That might be worth having a think about. Okay, this will give us a, a value in hertz, as in per second, whereas the omega will tell you something in radians per second. So a long time ago when spectroscopy was first being developed, the numbers that came out of here would be um, slightly hard to deal with. So as a matter of convenience, we define a thing called a wave number. And the wave number is nothing but the frequency divided by the speed of light. This gives us values that are easy to deal with in a sort of everyday situation. The wave number is, is often given the symbol nu, but with a little squiggle on the top. So again, for historical reasons and keeping the numbers quite nice, um, we're going to get something that ends up in reciprocal length as its units. So depending on what we put in for our value as c, we'll get the units in reciprocal length of whatever c has its length units in. So we could use um, meters per second in here, but to get the numbers to work nicely, we tend to write the speed of light in reciprocal centimeters. So the speed of light is three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. So overall, we can now say that the wave number has this formula as we intended to derive, and it will output uh, a wave number in centimeters to the minus one. And the values in centimetres to the minus one should be familiar to you from experience of, say, infrared spectroscopy experiments. OK, just coming back to this diagram at the top now, and why is this relevant? Well, this one mass system uh, has the general solution, um, which is very, very similar to this. This will have the angular frequency is equal to, well, let's call this big M as a mass. The angular frequency is equal to K over big M. So we notice a similarity with the derivation that we've got for our diatomic over here, where we've substituted in the reduced mass and defined it as such. So the neat thing we have now is we can treat the whole system, the whole diatomic is directly analogous mathematically to a system of reduced mass, just oscillating with one spring attached to a fixed place of spring constant K. This is quite a common trick that's done in chemistry and physics settings where we can reduce our slightly complicated problem of the motion of two particles. If there's a system with only one degree of freedom, which is our stretch, uh, keeping the center of mass constant, we can re-express this in terms of a single particle's movement of a, a modified mass. Just a final comment on the extremes of this situation. We could consider a situation where m1 is very, very much bigger than m2. So in this circumstance, the reduced mass will go to, well, m1 times m2. And well, if m1 is much bigger than m2, it's essentially just m1 if you try to add them together. And then this will be equal to m2. So we can see now that the reduced mass expression collapses down to a situation where, the say, m1 is so big that it's a, essentially a non-moving wall, as in this diagram at the top. Okay then, if you found this video interesting, please do consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel.
just a note to sort of say that if you want to go any further with this to molecules that involve more than two atoms, you're going to need to maybe start thinking about group theory and you can derive similar things using a consideration of energy.